Good morning. Welcome to St. John's United Methodist Church. I'm Grant Armstrong. I get to serve here as pastor. I am so grateful you have come to be a part of worship this morning. We are starting a brand new sermon series this month called Planting Parables. Jesus, when he was teaching, spent a lot of time talking in ways that were connecting directly with some of the, the unique experiences of the congregation, the people that came to listen and to engage in his ministry. But he also spoke in a way that was a bit mysterious. So speaking clearly in terms that they could understand, but in spiritual language so that they would have to seek out wisdom from God. And it's an interesting paradox that we run across with this beautiful teaching that Jesus offers us through these parables around planting and gardening and agriculture. And so we're going to spend some time this month looking at those. And today we're looking at what Jesus would basically go on to describe as a wasteful farmer, one who was just scattering seeds all over the place, not concerned about what kind of yield they would bring, but being generous in offering the opportunity for growth anyhow. And so we're going to reflect on that parable this morning. We're going to have an opportunity to lift our voices and hearts in praise. We get to care for one another through prayer. And I don't know if you could smell on the way in, but we have a unique and special treat for communion this morning because it's Bread for the World Sunday, and Jane is going to share a little bit more with us about that later on during the mission moment. We wanted to be able to extend the table and enhance the table a little bit today, and so there are fresh rolls that we will each get to share during our time of communion this morning. And I know it's not what we normally do, but it's really good. And so I, I am looking forward to the opportunity to being able to share in that with you this morning, uh, to have a chance to experience the grace of God and God's filling of our lives through that marvelous gift of communion. And so thanks for coming to be a part of all of that. Would you please take a moment to register your attendance today and let us know that you have been a part of today's service by going to thenewstjohns.com slash worship. There you can find a link to our attendance form where you can let us know that you've been a part of this service, whether you're a part of our at-home congregation or here with us in person. You can also let us know if you have a change of contact information, address, phone number, email, whatever it is. It's a good way to let me know if you have a need for pastoral response. So if you have a need for prayer or a visit before a surgery or a procedure, whatever it may be, that's a good way to let me know. It's also a way to let me know if you are a guest or just getting to know St. John's a little bit and starting to feel like you want to give us a chance to get to know you a little bit better too. If you would fill out that information for me, even just as simple as your email address, that gives me an opportunity to be able to share a very simple gift with you and allows us to share a little bit more about who we are as a congregation and ways that you might be able to engage. So please take a moment to do that. If you have a mobile device or anything like that with you, please feel free to use it to interact in a few different ways also at that same website, that worship page. You can find a link to our paperless uh, bulletin, a uh, link to our weekly reminder newsletter. You can find a link to our secure online giving and links to our live feeds at both Facebook and YouTube. So please feel free throughout the course of the service to interact with any of those. You're more than welcome to do so. We also have uh, a special date coming up in the community. There is a community prayer service that is taking place uh, on Thursday the 5th. And so if you would have an opportunity to share a prayer, this is a time when people are going to be gathered together uh, at the Edwardsville Public Library for just a, a simple prayer meeting from 12 to 1230. And one of the things that our area churches and some of the, the people of faith in this community want to do is to be able to lift up the joys and concerns of the people of this community as we pray together. And so you may notice back where there is the, uh, the drop box for our offering, there is right next to it uh, a place where you can offer prayer requests, whether it's lifting up a joy or sharing a concern. There are also little slips of paper that are marked there. These are going to be lifted up in the community group, and so you can be as vague as you want to be, or you can be as particular as you want to be, but it's a good opportunity for believers all throughout the community to be able to lift our hearts together in prayer. And if there's something you would like to have lifted up, please feel free to, uh, to fill out one of those this morning. It's a, a good opportunity. Maybe on your way out, you know that you'd like to have a, a prayer listed. So that's a, that's a chance to do that and an invitation that we extend. And now I invite you to please stand as you are able. Good morning. My name is Kathy Fink Luna. Please join me in our call to worship. Our God gives us a mission Lord, help us live as disciples who make disciples of Jesus 
for the transformation of the world. Our God grants us a vision. By your grace, let us be a beacon of faith and service. Our God provides us with a pathway. Lord, in our lives, let us focus our gifts and passions to reflect your love in the world. Amen. Please join in the opening hymn. The words are on the screen and in your hymnal on page 103. be seated and join together in the morning prayer. God, when Jesus teaches us in parables, we don't always know what to think. There are mysteries in his words that we do not grasp except through faith, obedience, and your Holy Spirit. Do not let us miss the power of your instruction. Open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to understand and respond. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I would like to share a few announcements this morning. The St. John's UMC youth are selling annual blooming plants just in time for Mother's Day. Plants will be available to purchase today and next Sunday in the St. John's UMC parking lot from 10 a.m. until noon. Pre-order your plants by filling out the form online at the new stjohns.com backslash flower sale or purchase your favorites on Sunday and today. Payment in the form of check will be collected at pickup. All proceeds from this fundraiser will help support the youth as they attend mission trip this summer as well as other service projects and special activities. UMW United Methodist Women invite all women to their upcoming Ladies Tea this Wednesday, May 4th, 2022 from 2 p.m. until 3.30 p.m. in Fellowship Hall. Tea and three courses of delicious finger foods and sweet treats will be provided. Dress up in your finest attire or come casual. Hats and even gloves are optional. Fun trivia entertainment will be provided. Invite a friend or two and plan to join us. For details or questions, please contact Jan Denby at giveseedsofblessing at gmail.com. Stay up to date by following St. John's on Facebook and on our website, thenewstjohns.com. Now it's time for our children's moment. All right, everybody, come on up. 
Got some props today. All right, so here they come. Pastor Grant was talking about our story coming up. So you heard a little bit about it. And this is called a parable. A parable is a story that has kind of a second, second meaning, other lesson. So you guys have all helped. I know you guys have all helped in the mission garden. So you've been out in the dirt before, right? Okay, so if I'm going to put some seeds on here, will the seeds grow in the rocks? No. Well, will they grow in the dirt with a little bit of rock? Yeah. They might, but will they have very good roots? No. If there's lots of weeds and other plants that are going to peat, will they grow very well? A lot of competition, isn't there? How about this? Think they'll grow right here? Yeah. Will they have pretty good dirt? It would. Well, guess what? Jesus wasn't really talking about dirt and plants. Hmm. That's it. We just talked about that in our prayer. Parables can be kind of smart and kind of tricky. So Jesus wasn't really talking about plants. He was talking about our hearts. We've talked about our hearts a lot before. So if we want to spread God's love on our hearts, if our hearts are hard and we're angry and we're mad, is God's love going to grow very well in here? No, because we're going to be pretty crabby and pretty, pretty grouchy, right? Well, if we sprinkle a little bit of love on here, we might be like happy and lovey for a little while, but will we stay happy and lovey? Yeah, probably not, because sometimes those grouchiness comes out, doesn't it? Well, this one, this looks like it's growing pretty good stuff, doesn't it? So if we sprinkle God's love in here, you think it'll grow pretty good? It might, but sometimes all this other stuff gets in our way. We have so much going on that we want to play. We'd rather stay home and play than go to church, or we'd rather watch our TV show instead of thinking about reading the Bible or saying prayers, right? So sometimes our love gets kind of caught up with all this other stuff and we get pretty busy and we forget to love one another or forget to practice the things that help us love one another. So that one, so you think if we put God's love in here in a really good place and our hearts are ready and our soil's ready and our love is ready, will our love grow? It should. So this is what we want. We want people to practice praying. So to make your heart good, just like this dirt, we want your heart to be ready to go, and you have to practice praying, and you have to practice reading the Bible. If you come to church, we can tell you stories that help you understand Jesus. So that's what the story was. Jesus wants us to be like this. If we were going to farm love instead of plants, it's all in our hearts. We have to have our hearts in the right place. So that's what I want you to think about today, okay? All right, so you guys want to pray? I have a question. Yes, what's your question? Are you actually going to try to plant stuff in here? Well, we know how it would turn out. I could, but I think we know that this would be the winner, don't you think? Yeah, but it would be a cool... It would be a cool, cool experiment. What, what you've done, I don't think that will do anything. Better. I think you're right, and I think if our love and our hard rocks won't do anything either. So let's think about love and our good stuff. You're right. All right, oh, another question. So we are, so with real dirt and some rocks and you mix it in with the dirt, what... Would it make God's love? Well, if we kept it water, we would love for a little bit, but the love might get all kind of stuck up in those rocks. Our hearts, if we get angry and grouchy sometimes, sometimes our love gets mixed up in our angry and grouchiness. So if we take all the rocks, the angry, grouchy part, and we just leave it a loving heart, we will have a better love. So let's pray about that. Let's pray about having some love, all right? All right, let's hold our hands and bow our heads. Dear God, thank you for lessons that help us learn, help us love, and pray, and read the Bible to be like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good job, you guys. All right. Oh, I love As the children are heading back to their families, we're going to continue on in an attitude of prayer. We just saw a beautiful illustration of what Jesus intended parables to do, uh, to dig in <laughs> to really start exploring more of, Jesus, what are you saying here? And that was very, very sweet. I love to see that. Uh, during our prayer time, during the prayer hymn specifically, if you'd like to spend some time praying at the rail, you're welcome to do so. If you'd like to pray in your seats, you can do that as well. But if you'd like to sing along, you're welcome to do that. The lyrics are on your screen.
Let's join together in prayer. Loving God, we are thankful that you have drawn us here today and pray that you would simultaneously make our hearts good soil for your word and make us generous farmers of the seed of your word. We know from your scriptures that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And how can people hear if it is not preached? And how can it be preached if people are not sent? And so, Lord, we pray that you would send us, send us by your spirit to be filled with love, to be filled with hope, to have the type of joy that would be contagious, that people would see and know that our lives have been touched by your love, and when they inquire what causes us to be filled with such hope, to be able to declare it is because of what Jesus Christ has done and because of who he is. Lord, we pray that you would plant such hope in us, that it would grow and prosper, that you would take away any of the weeds that would compete for the nourishment that your word deserves, that you would remove from us any of the the rock and thistle that would choke out the, the root system. And God, we pray that you would nurture and nourish your goodness within us. God, we are grateful that this is all made possible not by our striving, not by our efforts, but by the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, and the grace that's offered to us through his life and death and resurrection, that by the Holy Spirit we can belong to you and know that we are your children, purchased at a price and dearly loved. And with that confidence, we pray that you would allow us to be in your service, that from the gratitude of our hearts, we might serve in loving response. And Lord, we're grateful to know that you hear our prayers this morning, those things that we lift in our hearts before you, maybe even those prayers that we cannot give voice to, but you know. You know our concerns, you know our joys, and so we bring them before you. And God, from the storehouses of your love, the abundance of your grace, you work within our lives to bring about good, as promised to all who love you and who are all called according to your purpose. We lift all of this to you, the concerns that we see around the world, especially this day, we lift before you those who uh, suffer needlessly in hunger, knowing that you have invited us to be a part of restoration, healing, and feeding those in need. God, we pray that by the nourishment that you provide, both for our physical bodies and for our spirits, you would continue to raise up a kingdom that is a, a force of great good and love in this world and that we would get to be a part of it. All this we pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, I get to invite Jane forward to share a little bit about Bread for the World. Every, every Sunday morning, Pastor Grant says, I get to serve here as pastor at St. John's. And I feel so thankful that I get to share um, news about Bread for the World and the offering of letters every year. And I'm sure he's not as jittery as I am (laughs) when he does his thing. Okay, so first I wanna share some good news. Last year, the letters we sent were asking Congress to uh, Congress people to co-sponsor the Global Malnutrition Prevention and Treatment Act. And after a year, uh, we had 102 co-sponsors, it's, which is a really good strong list. And just 
Wednesday of this week, we heard that the House of Representatives voted and passed the bill 384 to 44. I hope you understand that 384 votes out of a possible 435 is a landslide victory. Usually when the House passes something you hear, it passed by a very few votes on a straight line party vote, but not when Bread for the World is involved. Um, the reason we get a landslide victory like this is because of the way Bread for the World works with our congressmen. We avoid hateful partisan politics. We are always courteous and respectful. We lead with facts and an argument based on our faith. Christians in churches across the country write tens of thousands of letters every year. And we follow the bill as it makes its way through committees. We send more letters emails, phone calls, and some of us, like our local Edwardsville group, meets in person with our congressman every year um, in his local office. We have a very cordial relationship, even if we disagree. And that's how Bread for the World helps to pass wonderful victories for hungry people. I hope that you who wrote a letter last year can feel joy in this victory. The bill focuses on children in what we call the first 1,000 days of life. That's from conception to age two. It's the most vulnerable and critical period of human development. So it will provide foods fortified with nutrients like vitamin D, iron, iodine. It provides young children and pregnant women with nutritional supplements, and it supports new mothers to breastfeed. These are all simple, inexpensive, proven strategies to combat malnutrition. It is going to help millions of mothers and babies and toddlers just not only to survive, but to thrive. So I hope you feel joy in knowing that your letter made such a difference. Maybe you feel signing a letter that this is kind of small and insignificant. Maybe you feel a little cynical that one citizen's letter could really make a difference. Now, I know there are reasons to feel cynical, but I also know your little letter, it, it made a difference. All together, we made a difference. And so the vote was 384 yeses. Okay, so this year, the letter we're sending this year the bill that we passed um, did not have any funding attached to it. Global Nutrition right now is funded at about $150 million and has received very minimal increases for quite some years. So we are asking Congress to double the funding to $300 million in next year's budget. And I know $300 million sounds like a lot, but it is a fraction of a fraction of the total international development budget, which is less than 1% of the federal budget. And why would we need such an increase? After the good news, I have to tell you the bad news. I'm sure you all know that global hunger is increasing. This is because of terrible droughts brought on by climate change and because of armed conflict in many places, now including Ukraine. Actually, Russia and Ukraine together account for about 26% of total wheat exports in the world. 
And with the war going on, Ukrainian farmers are not planting. The cost of fuel and fertilizer has skyrocketed, and the cost of food is through the roof, not just in Ukraine, but in Afghanistan, Yemen, Ethiopia, Somalia, and other places. So please sign one of the letters out on the table. Bread for the World would like us to handwrite all our letters, but I have found that I don't get a lot of letters if I make you write them out. So they're already printed. All you have to do is sign them. If you would, just take a minute and scribble something personal like, um, this means a lot to me, or thank you for considering this. Or you could even say, if you're in Rodney Davis's district, good luck in your new district, because he will not be our congressman next year. Um, anyway, so if you are worshiping from home, Lynette has a link in the reminder. You can just click on it, and it will be easy for you to personalize. Uh, and print it out and mail it yourself. I also want to mention that New Bethel and Emmanuel are both going to join us this morning writing letters. So they're, they're doing it at their own churches. And we're going to, um, people from all three churches are going to hand carry the letters to Rodney Davis over to his local office. So you won't need stamps this year. And please consider joining the local Bread for the World group. We meet the third Tuesday at 1 o'clock. We've been meeting by Zoom, so I can easily put you on the Zoom connection. Um, and we might start meeting in person again. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jane. It's a, an organization that I've been a part of since 2012, and it really does make a difference. And your personal touches matter. This is a way that uh, we, don't, we don't get to solve global, global hunger just through food pantries. We get to solve global hunger by inviting our faith to advocate for changes to systems and structures that keep people hungry. So your, uh, your voices matter, and we appreciate that. If you'd like to support the work that Christ is doing through St. John's, you can do so by offering gifts and service to the ministries of St. John's. You can drop a gift in the drop box near the entryway. You can share gifts through the link to secure online giving at the new stjohns.com slash worship. You can also share your gifts by mailing checks into the church. But however it is that you respond to God's goodness in your life, you do make a difference, and we're thankful. standing as we read aloud 
the word of God. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Later that same day, Jesus left the house and sat beside the lake. A large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. Then he sat there and taught as the people stood on the shore. He told many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. As he scattered them across his field, some seeds fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plants soon wilted under the hot sun, and since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I was raised immediately next door to some rich farmland. Literally adjacent to my childhood home was a field that rotated between corn and beans during growing season and snowmobiles in the winter. But still, it wasn't until my previous appointment in a rural setting that one of the farmers in the congregation invited me and my family to ride along in a planter or a combine at those certain points of planting and harvesting during the year. And despite my proximity to agriculture growing up, I was definitely not a farm boy. So for this planting ride along, I was frankly amazed. You go into this nutrient-rich field that has been maybe prepped with some anhydrous and tilled. You set your perimeter on the GPS on the planter, and then stuff like row control will cover your field and show which bins are active and which are shut off so you don't accidentally double plant a segment of your acreage. Agriculture is much more high-tech now than I ever imagined it to be. And for folks who have the corresponding gear, that process can be largely automated and incredibly efficient. So you set your points, you monitor your seed level, you get to listen for warnings, occasionally lift your frame equipment and turn the machine around for the next line. I saw a, a seed tender drop thousands of seeds into the bins, and as the seeds were being dropped in, they were being lubricated with graphite and talc. It was high tech. The yield Prob prob uh, probabilities were very, very high. It was efficient. It was precise. And it was nothing like what Jesus was talking about in this parable. Nothing at all. You wouldn't plant crops or a garden the way Jesus describes in this parable. Anyone who does is wasteful. You're dropping seeds with something like a one in four chance of anything actually producing a yield. That's foolish. It makes no sense. Now, the folks in the Galilee region where Jesus was raised and where he's speaking, know this. They know better. That's not how you farm. You only plant where you know that there is a decent chance for a good harvest. He was telling them things that were counterintuitive, but they listened because, and this is our first lesson, Jesus goes to people and speaks their language. Jesus goes to people and speaks their language. Later that same day, we read, as Jesus left the house and sat beside the lake, a large crowd gathered round, and he got in a boat. He sat there and taught as the people stood on the shore. He told many stories in the form of parables such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. 
He knew what would catch their attention. Folks in the crowds would think, hey, a farmer planting seeds, that could be me. When I talk about agriculture, for me, it is pure farming magic. I misuse terms in ways that would get me laughed out of any donut shop where old, good old boys sit around in the morning with mesh hats that have seed company logos on the front. I don't know the language like a native speaker does, but Jesus knew it. He spoke it. Even when the message was confusing, he used all the right phrases. And as you know, his lesson is not about farming. It's actually a terrible lesson in farming. It's a lesson about the awesome privilege of awakening people to the kingdom of God. And Jesus' methods always mirror his message. Jesus went to them. Some people just wait for stuff to come to them. One of my seasoned preacher colleagues tells a story about a guy he knew who was a mechanic. He ran his own auto shop, and every time he'd go into the shop, he'd ask the guy, hey, how's it going? How's it going? And the guy would always respond, just letting it come to me. Just letting it come to me. Every time he'd go in, same thing. How's it going? Just letting it come to me. And at a certain point, my friend went into the place and found that there was always a lack of business. There were not very many customers. Things to be go seemed to be going slow. And it really looked like it was starting to wear on the business owner. And so he asked his usual question, how's it going? And the man responded, I'm starting to think I'm going to need to go out and get it. Jesus taught at the synagogues to reach people who were in the synagogues, but then he left the synagogue. He went to where the people who weren't properly religious were. He spoke to them in ways that they would understand. Now, the, the former broadcaster in me wants to be polished all the time. The guy who went to seminary wants to get my money's worth for the theological vocabulary that they taught me. And in our services, we'll sometimes sing songs with lyrics like, A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. But that can all be pretty cryptic sometimes. And we see how Jesus just went out and talked with folks about the kingdom of God and how it was like a, a really wasteful farmer. And that takes us to lesson two. Jesus' parables invite people to engage his teaching with spiritual ears. Jesus' parables invite people to engage his teaching with spiritual ears. He goes on, Jesus' teaching, as he scattered it across the field, some seeds fell on a footpath and the birds came and ate them. Others fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The plants sprang up quickly, but they soon wilted beneath the hot sun and died because the roots had no nourishment in the shallow soil. Other seeds fell among thorns that shot up and choked out tender blades, but some seeds fell on fertile soil and produced a crop that was 30, 60, even 100 times as much as had been planted. I used to be active in a street ministry called No Greater Love. It was a, one of the varieties of ministries that traveled down to the New Orleans Mardi Gras to share Jesus with people. It wasn't at the end of the street ministry spectrum that is, you know, fully hateful and completely obnoxious, but it was definitely outside of the comfort zone of a lot of church-going folks. So my first time going was 2004. I was understandably scared to death. I, I wanted a test to discern whether or not I could be an effective instrument of sharing God's word. I wanted to go as a test before I entered into ministry, before I would become and offer my life to be a pastor. See, because I know that only 2% of Christians share an invitation with somebody over the course of a given year. 2%. We can name all sorts of reasons why churches are shrinking all across America, but if we as church members never invite anybody to a church or a relationship with Jesus, we don't really need to be Sherlock Holmes to figure out what's going on. I simply did not want to be a part of the 98% who never did anything to invite somebody, and I knew I had no business being a pastor if God couldn't use me to help people enter into a new or deepening relationship with Jesus. I was sure willing, but I wanted to know. I needed to know if God could use me. And at first, we were doing ministry on the streets. I tried to be clever. I gave people tracts and told them that it was an invitation to the after party. I tried to sound smart. People wanted evidence of God's existence, so I tried to explain Anselm's ontological proof. I tried being argumentative. Maybe I could debate with people using some apologetics. I could be entertaining. I could drop lyrics to Conway, Kanye West's Jesus Walks before he was even trying to make gospel albums. All of these things did a great job at drawing attention to me. It didn't do much to bring people to Jesus. But do you know what often worked, though? Listening listening to people. 
hearing what's on their hearts, being attentive to what God might be doing in that moment, and offering to pray with people so that Jesus might meet them at their point of need. It was almost painfully simple as a process, but it was challenging to do because it forced me to listen in a way that wasn't just me waiting for my next opportunity to talk. I had to listen in a way that generated trust and organically invited Jesus into their situation. I couldn't make any assumptions about somebody's spiritual state based on what they were wearing, who they were with, whatever sort of possible indulgent activities that they were engaging at the time. The story they were living was deeper than anything my eyes could see, and in order to notice what God was doing, I needed to listen with spiritual ears and see with spiritual eyes. I needed to show love in ways that may have worked against my natural affinities, but instead reflected the incredibly generous heart of our God. And it took me a lot of trial and error to get there before I could become anything close to skilled in that regard. You know how many advanced degrees it requires to be able to do that? None. Zero. It just takes Jesus in our hearts and a willingness to listen in ways that afford us the opportunity to share seeds of life. And when it comes to digging, digging into the scriptures, I like to study. I enjoy reading the commentaries that describe the history and the cultural context and the rhetorical strategies and the nuance found in the original languages. That's helpful, but it can never take the place of sitting with a passage of scripture and spending some time letting it work on my heart, and spending time asking God, given, given all that I've come to know about this passage, what do you want to share at this point with these people? With Scripture, we can't neglect the study, but we also cannot neglect the spiritual. They work together, which is why, and this is lesson three, asking Jesus to explain is a major part of the point. Asking Jesus to explain is a major part of the point. Jesus says anyone who is willing to hear should listen and understand. Now, understand doesn't just mean to get something mentally. It doesn't mean to just have a, a mental assent or comprehension. It means literally to stand under a thought as though it were a banner. Do we not only get it, but do we stand under Christ's teaching? We read how his disciples came and asked him, why do you always tell stories when you talk with people? So connecting with Jesus to deepen the relationship is key, both for our growth and for the possibility of reaching others. And so in the continuance of Matthew 13, Jesus explained, you have been permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others have not. Those who are open to my teaching, more understanding will be given and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But to those who are not listening, even what they have will be taken away from them. That's why I tell these stories, because people see what I do, but they don't really see. They hear what I say, but they don't really hear, and they don't understand. This fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, you will hear my words, but you will not understand. You will see what I do, but you will not perceive its meaning. For the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear, and they have closed their eyes, so their eyes cannot see, and their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. See, this, this whole thing is a little bit about our faithfulness and our obedience, but it is a lot about God's power, about God's desire. Jesus was teaching about how people would respond to God's instruction. And again, for those who had spiritual ears, they could hear God encouraging and correcting them through this teaching. The obvious question for this group would be, what kind of soil am I? So Jesus explained, verse 19, the seed that fell on the hard path represents those who hear the good news about God's kingdom and don't understand it. The evil one comes and snatches the seed away from their hearts. I remember one time I was a, a part of a group. We were getting ready to have a big event, and we were receiving some instructions from the leader. And the leader had us all gathered together and told the group, all right, I need you all back here by five. And there was a, a young lady in the group who very, you know, coyly raised her hand, and she said, do you mean five o'clock? And I knew in that moment she was going to need help getting to where she needed to go. She was going to need some assistance. She had a decent heart. She had best intentions, but she did not have a lot of understanding. Some people are that way with God's word. You know, if Scripture tells us something like, don't gossip, gossip, somebody will raise their hands and coyly say, do you mean about people? 
You might need help getting where you're going in that case. What you have might be snatched away. And yet, Jesus says the farmer plants on that soil anyhow. In verses 20 through 21, it says the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and receive it with joy, but like young plants in such soil, the roots don't grow deep. They are doing fine at first, and then they wilt as soon as they have problems or are persecuted because they believe the word. They wilt as soon as they have problems. I witness people who have recently met Jesus. They get an idea of how the church should be, and their expectations are high, but then they run across more of the church's bloody and indefensible history. Throughout 2,000 years, the lifespan of just about and the lifespan of just about any single congregation, they look at a room full of hypocrites, maybe, and say, this isn't what Jesus intended, and they bolt. Instead of looking at a room filled with other imperfect people and saying, this looks like a room of people who need Jesus just like I do. But when they disappear, they wilt. And I witness people who have wonderful encounters with Jesus within the, the bubble of the church. And then they try and flex their faith in other areas of life. And maybe they even get gently rejected. They're devastated that someone wouldn't instantly feel the love of Jesus that they experience. And the rejection becomes too much. And they wilt with the, the slightest resistance. And yet the farmer plants there anyhow. In verse 22 Jesus talks about how the thorny ground represents those who hear and accept the good news, but all too quickly the, the message is crowded out and the cares of this life, the lure of wealth, make it so no crop is produced. I was talking with a good friend one time early in my walk with Christ, and he was talking about another friend of his who found Jesus, met Jesus, and it was changing her life. And he said, I think faith is fine as long as it doesn't change you. And I didn't know much, but I knew enough to ask at that time, is it really faith if it doesn't change you? There are folks who think Jesus is just fine as long as he doesn't impact our lives in any perceptible way, as long as he doesn't cramp my lifestyle or interfere with my career or my earnings or interrupt my priorities. Knowing that Jesus exists is very different from existing for Jesus. And yet the farmer plants there anyhow. In verse 23, Jesus says the good soil represents the hearts of those who truly accept God's message and produce a huge harvest, 30, 60, even 100 times as much as has been planted. And you know when you can tell that the seed has been nourished and taken root? There's a harvest. There's a harvest to show for it. If Jesus is at work in our hearts and lives, there will be more of Christ in our lives to show for it. New hope. New joy, fuller recovery, more justice and forgiveness, more siblings in faith, greater generosity and service, and less of the parts of us that prevent God from being more fruitful in our lives. John chapter 12, Jesus says, the truth is, a kernel of wheat must be planted in the soil, and unless it dies, it will be alone, a single seed. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who despise their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. All those who want to be my disciples must come and follow me because my servants must be where I am. And if they follow me, the Father will honor them. We get to experience God's word burying and taking root in our hearts. And we've got to get ourselves buried also. Only when we surrender to Jesus do we experience the fullness of life and become people God uses to bring a harvest that is maybe 30 or 60 or 100 fold that first seed. And then like Jesus' wasteful farmer, we'll plant God's grace and word everywhere. And just let God determine which soil is good soil. But first, always first, God plants goodness into our lives. And that's why once again, we approach the table of grace. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let's join together in the confession that's on the screen. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. 
us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's take a moment to quietly reflect and confess before the Lord. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. This proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. And when, you t when we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. And on the night when he gave himself up for us, he took bread and giving thanks to you, broke it and shared it with his disciples, saying, take and eat, all of you, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat of it, remembering me. And likewise, when the meal was finished, he took the cup and giving thanks to his heavenly Father, shared it with his disciples and said, Take and drink all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink of it, remembering me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves with prayer and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them to be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until you return in final victory and we feast together at your heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. I would invite those who are assisting with serving communion to come forward at this time. And as they do, I get to offer a little bit of instruction as you are released to come forward by the ushers. Today, I would invite you to uh, come and kneel at the rail and extend your hands. You will be handed a piece of bread from the basket that will include a napkin. You are welcome to take as much of the bread as you want for communion and then wrap it in the napkin and take it with you if you would like. You are more than welcome to do that. Uh, or you can consume the whole thing today. It is your bread and the body of Christ, so feel free to do with it what you would like. You will receive a cup, and you can drink that immediately. Once you have received, we are going to dismiss the rail with a blessing. Then you can return to your seats and spend some time praying, meditating, listening to the music, whatever you'd like to do. If you have a gluten aversion or allergy, we have a gluten-free option that is available for you today, so please feel free to receive that. Simply let us know uh, that that is a need for you, and we will gladly provide it. But as the table is set and all is ready, as the ushers dismiss you, we invite you come and receive of this wonderful gift of God.
I would invite you to please stand as you are able. Let's sing one verse of our closing hymn, if that's all right. It's worth singing, but maybe not the whole thing. Let's join together in leaning on the everlasting arms. One verse, please. Thank you all so much for being present at today's service, for participating, for everybody who has contributed and worked so hard to make it possible. I would like to extend an invitation. Uh, Brianna, who has been our child care coordinator for the past couple of years uh, and through the hardest parts of COVID, uh, is taking on new responsibilities in other positions, and so uh, she is departing us. So if you have a chance, uh, thank her for her work, and there are some refreshments in the fellowship hall to celebrate her, so please uh, feel free to enjoy those as well. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.